Heavenly Father, thanks for the chance to be together today. Thank you for your word, for your promises. And uh, thank you that we have Jesus. And because of him, we have hope and we have salvation. Uh, We have comfort and we have life. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to start off with just a question this morning. And the question is this. Uh, When I say the word righteous, uh, what is the first thing that comes to mind for you? Uh, I grew up in the 80s, and there was a movie that was real popular in the 80s uh, known as Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Some of you may remember this movie. Uh, Ferris Bueller was kind of a slacker, uh, was not the best student in the world, but there was the secretary at his school who really liked him. Her name was Grace, and she used to refer to Ferris Bueller as a righteous dude. And if you grew up in the 80s, maybe that's the first thing that comes to mind for you when you think of the word righteous. Or maybe you grew up a little bit earlier in the 60s, or maybe you're just kind of kind of like a a, a pop music aficionado from the 50s and 60s and 70s like I am, there was a really popular brother group. Uh, They sang these amazing soaring tunes, like Unchained Melody. And the two brothers were known as the what? Righteous Brothers. If you like pop music from the 60s, maybe that's the first thing that comes to mind for you when you hear the word righteous. I, I was thinking about this. The word righteous isn't a word that we use a lot in our culture and in our society. Uh, We'll talk about terms that are similar. Uh, We'll talk about things like being good or being moral or being ethical or being kind. Uh, But if you turn on the news, you're not going to hear a lot about what it means to be righteous. And yet in the Bible, righteousness is one of these super central concepts. Uh, Psalm 7 verse 11 says this, God is a righteous judge. If you're looking for one of the main attributes of who God is, one of the main attributes of who God is is this, God is righteous. Uh, Psalm 19 verse 9, the decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. And so not only do we have a righteous God, what he says, uh, this book, uh, his decrees, his laws, they too are righteous. Or how about this, Proverbs 21, verse 3, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Here's the idea in Proverbs 21. We have a God who is righteous. He issues decrees that are righteous, and so we are called to be, Proverbs 21 says, righteous. We are called to do righteousness. Not only that, Psalm 111, verse 3 says that God's righteousness endures forever. Here's how big of a deal righteousness is. Righteousness is one of those things that has a really long shelf life. Uh, There's nothing flash in the pan about righteousness. God's righteousness is meant to endure forever. Now you go one more psalm forward, Psalm 112 verse 3, and it says that our righteousness is also something that will endure forever. I I was thinking about this. Maybe one of the reasons that we don't talk a lot about righteousness in our world is because maybe we are more concerned about what's right now than we are with what's righteous. Uh, This is why we'll put a bunch of stuff on a credit card that we know we won't be able to pay off when the bill comes due, and it has an outlandish interest rate that we're going to get ourselves deeper and deeper into debt with uh, because we're kind of interested in instant gratification. We're more interested in what's right now than we are with what's righteous. This is why we will binge watch a whole season or even a whole series worth of a show on Netflix in one night rather than doing it the old-fashioned way. Anybody remember the old-fashioned way where you'd have your favorite show, it would come on once a week, and you had to watch it at the time it was actually on? Anybody remember TV like that? A lot of people don't do that anymore. They just watch it all at once because we live in this culture uh, that is kind of served by instant gratification. We are more concerned with what's right now than we are with what's righteous. And yet, righteousness in the Bible, it is such a big deal. It's a big deal in God, he is righteous. It's a big deal in God's word, his decrees are righteous. And so it ought to be a big deal to us too. And so today, we're just gonna talk about righteousness. And really, I wanna ask two big questions today, and the two big questions are these. Uh, The first question is, what is righteousness? Because I'm not sure that many of us even have a clearly defined concept of what righteousness is. If I was to say, give me a definition of righteous, I'm not even sure that all of us could define the word. And then the second big question that I want to ask is this. How do I get righteousness? 
If righteousness is such a big deal in the Bible, if it is a central attribute of God, if it is a feature of God's word, then maybe it's something that we ought to get for ourselves. Maybe it's something that we ought to acquire. So how do I get righteousness? Those are the two big questions. And we'll start with the first of these two big questions, which is this. What is righteousness? Uh, let me break down the word righteous for you here. Uh, let's begin just by doing a little bit of etymology work. Uh, the word righteous actually comes from two different words. Uh, one is the word right. And the other is the word wise. Uh, you put them both together and you get the word righteous. Uh, let's start with the word rights. Rights is a moral word. It gives us moral categories between things that are right and wrong, between things that are good and bad. And so most of us know at least some basic fundamentals about morality. For example, is it right or wrong or good or bad uh, to kill your neighbor? Is that right or is that wrong? That is wrong. Okay. Is it right or wrong or good or bad to love your neighbor? Is that right or wrong? That's right. And so morality tends to work a lot of times in kind of closed categories. Uh, th there's not a lot of gray area between killing your neighbor and loving your neighbor. One of those things is clearly right, and the other one of those things is clearly wrong. And so part of being righteous is being moral, knowing your moral categories and standing in them and sticking by them. But then there's the second word that makes righteous up, which is this word wise. Now wise is a little bit trickier because righteousness involves wisdom, and wisdom is more than a moral category. Wisdom is not so much about what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. Wisdom is more about what is better and what is worse. What can lead you to more and what can leave you with less. Sometimes what is wise doesn't always have to do with what is strictly moral. For example, if you invest in something, a stock or something like that, uh, you're not so much interested in what is moral. I mean, you are because you don't want to do anything illegal or immoral, which you can do. But a lot of times it's more about wisdom. Which stock is going to give me a better dividend? Which stock is going to pay me a better return? Am I going to wind up with more or am I going to wind up with less? Am I going to invest in something that is better, or am I going to invest in something that is worse? Those are the kinds of questions that wisdom asks. What righteousness does is it takes both of these categories, what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, and also wisdom, what is better, what is worse, what is more, what is less, and it puts them together, and it always gets everything perfectly right. You're always wise, and you're always right, and that's what it means to be righteous. Uh, here's a good synonym for the word righteous, according to the Bible. A good synonym for righteous, according to the Bible, is perfect. You never make a mistake. There's never a bad piece of wisdom that you engage in, never a bad investment that you make, and of course you never stray out of the good moral boundaries that you are called to live in. When you do those two things, when you're always wise and always right all of the time, that means that you are righteous. Uh, Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2, the psalmist puts it like this, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? Only the one whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous. And I want you to pick up on this word blameless here in Psalm 15. Uh, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, and the Hebrew word for blameless is the word tom. Uh, this is also a word that can be translated as perfect. And so, who can be in the presence of God? Who can dwell with God? Who can be in his presence? The one who is tom, the one who is perfect, and the one who does, the psalmist says in the very next line, what is righteous. Because to be righteous means to be perfect, and to be perfect means to be righteous. Now, uh, this right here, this definition of righteousness, this conception of righteousness does lead us to a, an itsy-bitsy problem. And the itsy-bitsy problem is this. Raise your hand if you're perfect. <laughs> That's the problem. Because we're called to be righteous, according to the Bible. 
God is righteous, his word is righteous, so we're called to be righteous because we're called to be like God, and yet none of us are actually Tom. None of us are perfect, which means that none of us are righteous. You see, we have this disconnect. We may know what righteousness is, but that doesn't mean that we always do what righteousness does. I know, for example, that sleep is very important. There have been a ton of studies done recently on the importance of at least getting seven hours of sleep. It's even better to get eight hours of sleep. Here's the question. Do I always get seven or eight hours of sleep? No, I do not. Because it always seems in life like there's plenty to do. There are plenty of projects to work on. There are plenty of errands to run. There are plenty of chores to take care of. There are plenty of things at work to catch up on. I fall prey to something when I should be going to bed at night. And I call it the one more thing fallacy. Maybe you fall prey to this too. I figure if I can just take care of one more thing, then I'll be able to lay down. Then I'll be able to rest. And before I know it, it is way too late and I wake up and I'm groggy and I'm cranky and nobody wants to be around me. Not even Jesus wants to be around me sometimes because I can get cranky when I get too tired. Here's the thing. I'm guessing and really I'm hoping because I don't want to feel bad. I'm guessing that that kind of a struggle is not unique to me. We all know what righteousness is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we do what righteousness does. I do know this, at least according to the Bible, I'm not alone. The Apostle Paul himself, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, he struggled with this. He knew what righteousness was, but that didn't mean that he did what righteousness does. Romans 7 verse 19, he puts a struggle like this. I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this is what I keep on doing. This right here is not only Paul's condition and Paul's situation, this is the human condition and the human situation. We know what righteousness is, but we don't do what righteousness does. We want to get eight hours of sleep a night, but we stay up too late. We want to be patient with our kids, but golly, they really know how to push our buttons, don't they? We want to be close to our spouse, but then something happens, a little disagreement or some hurt feelings, and that creates some distance. We want to work hard at the office, but you know what? It's so easy to pick up your phone and waste time on social media. We want to steward our money well, but we wind up splurging on that little item over here or that little luxury indulgence over there. And on and on and on the list goes. Just because we know what righteousness is doesn't mean that we do what righteousness does. And so the question is, if we don't do what righteousness does, how do we get Righteousness. That's our second big question. How can we become righteous in our lives? Now, in order to answer this question, let's start here. A lot of you know this. Today is kind of a special day in church world. Uh, today we celebrate something called Reformation Day, and this harkens back to a date, October 31st, 1517, 502 years ago. Uh, there was a young Roman Catholic monk. His name was Martin Luther, and he saw a bunch of corruption in the church of which he was a part. There was political corruption, theological corruption, ecclesiological corruption, and uh, he wanted to do something to make what was wrong in the church, right. He was interested in righteousness. And so he decided that he was going to nail 95 theses uh, for discussion to a church door where he lived at the time in Wittenberg, Germany. Because one of the struggles that Martin Luther was having in his own life was not just about the unrighteousness of the church, it also had to do with the unrighteousness in his own life. Because Martin Luther struggled with the same thing that Paul struggled with, with the same thing that I struggled with and with the same thing that all of us struggle with, which is even though Martin Luther knew what righteousness was, he didn't always do what righteousness does, and it drove him nuts because he wanted to be a righteous dude. In fact, here's one of the things he wrote. He wrote this. He said, I came to hate the phrase, the righteousness of God, 
which, according to the use and the custom of all my teachers, I have been taught to understand philosophically regarding the formal or active righteousness, as they called it, with which God is righteous and he punishes the unrighteous sinner. And so here's what Martin Luther knew about righteousness. He knew that there was a righteous God, he was not righteous, and so God deserved and was able, had the ability to punish him in his unrighteousness. And he did not like that. Though I lived at a monk, he continues, with out reproach. In other words, he was a pretty good guy. I felt that I was still a sinner before God. I had an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that God was placated by my satisfaction. The idea of a satisfaction is Martin Luther would try to do a bunch of good stuff to balance out his bad stuff, but no matter how much good stuff he did, he never thought that God was satisfied with him. And so, Martin Luther says, I did not love, yes, I hated this righteous God who punishes sinners like me. Luther had a problem. He knew there was a righteous God, and he knew he was not a righteous man, and this actually led him to hate the righteous God who punishes sinners, which, by the way, to hate God in and of itself is unrighteous. And so Luther's big question is this, how do I get righteousness? How do I become a righteous person who can actually stand before and measure up to a righteous God? That was Luther's big question. Now, it's this question right here that actually takes us to a little story that we're going to be taking a look at from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 18. This is a story from Jesus, because in Luke 18, in this story, Jesus actually gives us the answer to Martin Luther's question. In this story, Jesus actually deals uh, with Martin Luther's existential crisis about how we as unrighteous people can actually be righteous before a perfectly righteous God. And so if you've got a Bible, open to Luke 18. We're going to start at verse 9. Luke 18, beginning at verse 9. Uh, here's the setup for Jesus' story. Uh, to some who were confident of their own righteousness, and they looked down on everybody else. Jesus told a parable. He told a story. Now, before we get to what Jesus says, I just want you to notice uh, who Jesus tells this story to in verse 9. He tells it to some who are confident of their own righteousness. Now, so far uh, in today's study, I've been talking to you about people who are not confident in their own righteousness. In fact, they're worried about their own righteousness because they know that there is a righteous God and they don't feel like they are very righteous people. That's the Apostle Paul. That's Martin Luther. That's me sometimes. Maybe it's you sometimes. But there's another category of people out there. And this category of people is a big category of people. And it's a group of people who even if they're not righteous, they feel think they are righteous. They think they're doing just fine, and they're really not worried about lacking righteousness because they think even if they are not perfect, even if they are not righteous, like in a whole perfect total sense, they are righteous enough. That's kind of the way they look at righteousness. In fact, if you skip down in the chapter just a little bit in Luke 18, you actually meet a person who thinks that he is righteous enough. Luke 18, verse 18, there is this young man who comes to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what righteous things do I have to perform to get in good with God? To which Jesus responds, well, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments, Jesus says. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And this young man responds to Jesus by saying, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, let's just ask this question. Do you really think that this young man had kept all of these commandments since he was a little boy? Do you think really that he had never, ever, 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 ever given false testimony like he's never told a lie, even a little white one? Okay, do you think that he's always honored his father and his mother even when he was a teenager? I mean, seriously, really? And yet this guy was willing to say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm good, I'm righteous, 
And in his mind, he was telling Jesus the truth uh, because he lived with this view and version of righteousness. Even if I'm not perfectly righteous, I'm righteous enough. And as long as I do my best, he was thinking, God can do the rest and it's just going to be fine. That's the way that he lived. That's the way that a lot of people live. Here's the problem with that conception of righteousness. When you're confident in your own righteousness, if you live long enough, one day you discover that you're not as righteous as you think you are. You're not as good as you think you might be. It's kind of like this. When I was in college, one of the games that I fell in love with, I love to play this game, uh, is a game called 42. Uh, This is a trump game, kind of like hearts or spades, except that rather than using cards, you use dominoes. And so you can call a trump, and you play with a partner, and you take a bunch of tricks. And the goal is uh, to get as many points from these dominoes as you possibly can between you and your partner. Uh, You you can actually uh, make bids. Uh, You start at 30, and you can bid all the way up to 42. Now, here's the deal, okay? I played this game a lot in college. I played it a lot in seminary. And you know what? I learned all sorts of strategies and tricks to win this game. I am a very sophisticated 42 player. If you'd like to play me, I can play you because I'm good at this game, okay? Now, uh, there was this one guy in college. And um, have you heard of a card shark like in Vegas? This guy was kind of like a domino shark, okay? Okay. In fact, I think he was playing all of us because uh, he and his partner wanted to start playing as a part of our group. And he started, innocently enough, winning some and losing some. But then he and his partner, out of the blue, they just started cleaning our clocks. I mean, he would have a terrible hand, and his partner would still manage uh, to help him take every single trick, every single domino, because they would manage to play everything just right. I remember there was this one time that I had, count them, 35 points in my one hand worth of dominoes. It's a lot of points. Like out of 42, that's a lot of points. And so I figured there was no way that I can lose this. You know what happened? I lost that hand. He and his partner managed to play their dominoes just right so that they took all of mine. And I got so frustrated, I started yelling and screaming in one of my fine, sanctified moments. You have got to be cheating, you cheater. Um, Now here's the thing. Looking back, I'm not sure that he was. It might have been I mean, I doubt this, but it might have been that maybe he was just better at the game than I was. (laughs) 20 years later, I'm not quite sure if I'm there, but I'm still thinking about it, okay? (laughs) It might have been that I overestimated just how good I really was. Now, I do that with dominoes, but I also do it sometimes with life. And this is what a lot of people sometimes do with life. We overestimate just how good we really are. And so Luke says, to some who are confident, and maybe another way to put it is this, to some who are overconfident, They overestimate just how good they really are. To some who like to fancy themselves as good and righteous, Jesus is going to tell these folks a story. And here's the story. Luke 18, verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. And the other was a tax collector. Uh, Let's pause right there. Jesus begins his story by introducing us to a couple of characters. Uh, Verse 10, uh, there's a Pharisee and there's a tax collector. Now, uh, if you were in the first century and you were listening to Jesus' story, uh, you would have had a gut-level, visceral reaction to these two characters in Jesus' stories. Uh, One of of these characters for you uh, would have been the hero, the obvious hero of this story, and the other for you, if you were listening in the first century, would have been the bad guy, the obvious bad guy in the story. Now, let's start with the hero. The hero of the story, obviously, would have been the Pharisee. 
Now, I know that in our day and age, uh, the word Pharisee has kind of a negative connotation to it. A lot of times we will say to people, do not be a Pharisee. But in the first century, in Jesus' day, in this world, the Pharisees were incredibly well respected. Uh, And and here's why, just a little bit of backstory, a little bit of history for you. Uh, In ancient Judaism, uh, there were three main religious sects, okay? Uh, The first sect was a sect known as the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees uh, were the guys who were very progressive. Uh, They were kind of liberal, and they denied a lot of basic uh, Jewish beliefs. Like, for example, they did not believe that when God came to earth, uh, there was going to be a resurrection of the dead. Uh, They did not believe that God could do any kind of a big miracle like that, nor would he do any kind of big miracle like that. They got a little bit too cozy with the Roman government, who was the occupying force in Israel at that time. They tended to be fairly affluent, and they wanted to keep their affluence, and so they cozied up the political power to make sure their affluence was protected. And so they would want to get fiscal advantages from the government. If you were kind of a down-home Jew in the first century, you know what you would call a Sadducee? You would call a Sadducee an elitist snob. A lot of the just common everyday Jews did not like the Sadducees because they had power, they had money, and they didn't really believe or live the way the common Jewish person believed or lived. Now, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from the Sadducees was another religious group known as the Essenes. Now, the Sadducees would get really cozy with the Roman government. The Essenes just wanted to escape everything. They wanted to escape everything religiously, philosophically, politically, culturally. They figured the only way that they were ever going to be able to remain spiritually pure was to head for the hills, literally. And so rather than living among civilization, rather than living in ancient towns, they actually moved to a bunch of caves known as the Caves of Qumran, where they spent all of their days, all of their hours, all of their lives doing nothing but studying the Bible and copying the Bible. In fact, some of you may have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls before. The Essenes were the ones who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, these ancient copies of the Bible, because that's pretty much all they did all day long was they copied and they studied the Bible. And they had this expectation that one day God was going to come and rescue them because they were super righteous, more righteous than everybody else, and God was going to wipe out all of the unrighteous, unholy people uh, like the Sadducees who got too cozy with the Roman government. Now again, if you were kind of a down-home first-century Jew, uh, the Essenes just struck you as maybe a little over the top, maybe a little bit weird. I mean, you wanted to be pious, but you didn't want to be kind of like that pious. You don't want to like just move to a cave somewhere. That seems a little strange. Now, in between these two camps, the Sadducees and the Essenes, uh, we find the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, they had a way of living their faith out. And it was challenging, but it wasn't weird. Uh, Their their kind of idea was this. We still want to be in the world, but we want to be different from the world. We don't want to cozy up to the Romans like the Sadducees, but we don't want to cloister ourselves off from everybody like the Essenes. And so we're going to be big into morals and ethics, uh, which was a big deal in the ancient Roman world because the ancient Roman world was full of all sorts of debauchery and sexual immorality. And the Pharisees eschewed all of that. They did not cozy up to all of that, but they didn't necessarily run from all of that. Here's what they did. The Pharisees, in a lot of ways, uh, they tried to live out their faith very piously, and they tried to make faith practical for the majority of Jews in the first century. In short, the Pharisees kind of sound like us. We don't want to be weird, but we don't want to sell the farm, become like the Sadducees. They kind of sound like us. You know, there was an ancient Jewish historian, his name was Josephus, and Josephus says this about the Pharisees. The Pharisees have the multitude on their side. Most people liked these guys. They thought that spiritually the Pharisees had it going on. And so when Jesus tells this story, 
And the first character he gives us is a Pharisee. Everybody would have thought, oh man, there's a spiritually enlightened guy. I need to learn something from him. He's going to be the hero of this story. But there's that other character, the second character that Jesus mentions, which is the tax collector. Now, as soon as Jesus says tax collector, everybody goes, oh man. I hope the Pharisee really socks it to the tax collector because nobody liked tax collectors in the first century. In fact, in the 21st century, how many of you have as your three favorite letters I-R-S? Raise your hand. (laughs) See, not much has changed in 21 centuries, right? It's kind of the same thing. Now, in the first century, it was actually a little bit worse because in the first century, tax collectors were considered to be traitors. Uh, Because here was the idea. Tax collectors uh, for Jews were actually from Jews. They were Jewish people, but they didn't work for the Jewish people. They worked for the Roman government. And the Roman government was the occupying force in Israel at this time. And not only were they the occupying force, they were an enemy occupying force. The Jews hated the Romans, and the Romans didn't really like the Jews. And so if you were a tax collector, if you were a Jew who was working for the Romans, the first thing other Jews would have thought of you is, you're a traitor. You're no good. You've sold out your ethnicity. You've sold out your history. You've sold out your culture. Just for the sake of money, you're a no good, rotten, dirty scoundrel. That's the way that people would think of tax collectors in the ancient world. I want to show you a quote from something called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a compendium of ancient Jewish wisdom teaching. And the Mishnah puts it like this. If you have a tax collector who enters your house, your house becomes unclean. If a tax collector knocks on your door and you let him in, you better break out the Swiffer because tax collectors are such unrighteous, gross, foul people that like make your whole house dirty. You don't want to be anywhere near a tax collector. And so Jesus starts this story and he says, there are two guys, there are two men who go up to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee and the other is a tax collector. Luke 18, verse 11, the Pharisee, he stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. You know, when everybody was listening to the story in the first century, they would have thought, okay, I need to imitate and emulate the Pharisee. The Pharisee's the good guy. The Pharisee's the spiritual guy. The Pharisee is, is, the, is the righteous guy. Now, it turns out that not only does everybody in the first century think that they ought to imitate and emulate the Pharisee, the Pharisee in Jesus' story thinks that the people listening to Jesus' story should imitate and emulate the Pharisee because he thinks that he is a good guy. He thinks that he is spiritually hot stuff. Uh, He has no self-confidence problems. In fact, notice uh, several things about this Pharisee. First thing in verse 11, notice where the Pharisee prays. The Pharisee stood by himself, verse 11, and prays because he didn't want to be around all the other common people because he's better than all of the other common people. Now, here's what's interesting about this little uh, preposition by, when the Pharisee stands by himself and he prays. Uh, it, the New Testament written in Greek, and uh, in Greek, prepositions are notoriously slippery. And so not only can you translate this as the preposition by, uh, you can also translate the same Greek word here as the preposition about. And so it could be that the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, as the NIV does it, but you could also translate this, uh, the Pharisee stood and prayed about himself. And if you actually listen to the prayer, uh, that's pretty much what he does, because he begins by addressing God. He begins his prayer by saying, God. But then the rest of the prayer is all about the Pharisee. God, the Pharisee says. I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. Uh, There's a pronoun that is primary in the Pharisee's prayer. You know what the pronoun is? I. The whole prayer is I, 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 I. This prayer has a focus, but it's not God. It's the Pharisee. 
Now, not only does the Pharisee think that he is kind of hot stuff, I, 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 he has no problem telling God what he thinks of other people, how they are not spiritually hot stuff. I thank you, God, the Pharisee says, that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. Here's the idea. The Pharisee thinks he is really good because he knows that other people are really bad. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. Sometimes, sometimes we can do what the Pharisee does in this prayer. Uh, Sometimes the way that we declare ourselves to be righteous is not by looking at the righteousness of God, but by looking at the sinfulness of others. We do it all the time. I may not be the perfect husband. I may not be the perfect wife, but at least I'm not as bad as that husband or that wife. I haven't cheated or I haven't betrayed or I would never say that to my spouse like they said that to their spouse. I may not be perfect, but I'm better than them We base our righteousness on somebody else's sinfulness. Or how about this? My politician may not be perfect, but hey, at least my politician isn't as bad as the -the fill-in-the-blank, right? As the Democrats, as the Republicans, as Nancy Pelosi, as Donald Trump, as whatever politician you don't like, you are offended by, you just put their name or their party right there. They may not be perfect, but they're better than the other person. Uh, We prop them up as righteous, but we do it on the back of other people's sinfulness. Or, here's, here's my personal favorite, okay? It goes something like this. I may not be perfect. I may not be a perfect guy or a perfect gal, but at least I'm better than the Pharisee in this parable. Because, like in our day and age, nobody likes the Pharisee in Jesus' story. I may not be perfect, but at least I'm better than the Pharisee in this parable who thinks that he's better than everybody else and looks down on everyone else. I don't look down on people, which is why I can look down on the guy who looks down on people and it's all okay, right? And we build our righteousness on the back of the Pharisee's sinfulness. That's a dangerous way to try to prop yourself up as righteous because it doesn't give you true righteousness. Righteousness does not come from other people's sinfulness. Now, that's not all the Pharisee prays in fairness to the Pharisee, right? He does kind of brandish his moral bona fides in this prayer, It's not just about other people's sinfulness. He does say, hey, look at me. Verse 11, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. Now, uh, let me begin just by saying this about this little line in the prayer. Uh, Fasting and tithing, just so you know, just so we're clear, uh, those are good things. If you've never fasted, I'd encourage you to think about it. It's a very spiritually enlightening and beneficial experience. If you don't tithe, you know what? Uh, Go back and listen to last weekend's message from Pastor Tucker. He he actually talked about the importance of tithing. This is is a good thing to do. But but here's the Pharisee's mistakes. He takes these two good things and he basically turns them into the sum total of everything. He makes these two things the basis for his whole righteousness and that's his downfall. In fact, notice how the Pharisee seems to conceive of righteousness. He seems to conceive of righteousness exclusively in external terms. In other words, he doesn't go to God, and and he doesn't say to God, Hey, God, uh, you've been working on me internally lately. You've been working on my heart, and thank you so much. I used to really struggle with hatred, but now you've filled me with love. Or I used to struggle with bitterness, but now you filled me with joy. <laughs> or it used to be like one big ball of worry, but now you filled me with peace. He doesn't talk about anything that has to do with anything in here, with his heart. It's all about what he can do externally. I can fast and I can tithe. I can act right. I can do right. Pharisee doesn't really seem to care about how he feels or what he thinks. 
the state of his soul. Because he does a couple of things, and because other people are really, really bad, the Pharisee says, that makes me righteous. Now here's the question we've got to grapple with. Does it make him righteous? Is that what righteousness really is? Is that real righteousness? Now, there's this other character in Jesus' story. He's the tax collector. He's not righteous. Luke 18, verse 13. The tax collector stood at a distance, wouldn't even come close to the temple. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and he said, God... Have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, the tax collector's prayer is very different from the Pharisee's prayer. The Pharisee, he wants to stand by himself and talk about himself. Notice the tax collector's disposition, verse 13. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast. And I want you to pick up on the little phrase, beat his breast. In the ancient world, beating your breast is a sign of deep sorrow. Uh, There's this really interesting line uh, right after Jesus dies on the cross. Luke 23, verse 48. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what had taken place, they beat their breasts and they went away. Why they do that? Because they were filled with sorrow. And they were filled with pain. And so this tax collector, he's filled with sorrow and he's filled with pain. And as he's beating his breast, he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, I mentioned this earlier, the New Testament written in Greek, and what's interesting about this prayer uh, from the tax collector is that in Greek, there's actually a definite article in front of the word sinner. And so when the tax collector prays, he doesn't just pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. He says, God have mercy on me, the sinner. Uh, Because he knows, he knows that he's done a lot of sinning. And if there could be like a poster boy for sin, it would be him. If you looked up sinner in the dictionary, uh, guess what? There'd probably be a picture of this tax collector right next to it. He is the archetype for all sinners. And so he doesn't just call himself a sinner. He calls himself the sinner. He's saying to God, God, I know that I'm a real mess. I know that I'm not righteous. I know that I'm at the bottom of the holiness barrel. There's nothing in me that I've done right. There's nothing in me that makes me wise. And so the question that I have for you, God, in my prayer is that is it possible? Is there a chance? Is there any sort of hope that even on a person like me, you could have mercy? That's the question of the tax collector. Because I'm not righteous and I know it. Now, it's the response to this prayer from the tax collector that is actually the zinger of Jesus' story. Luke 18, verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you that this man, that'd be the tax collector, rather than the other, that'd be the Pharisee, went home justified before God. The word justified means righteous. It was the tax collector who after he prays, goes home righteous before God. Now, if you were in the first century and you were listening to this parable, your mouth would have gone from here to here because you would have been saying, wait, 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 just a minute. You mean the good guy is the bad guy and the bad guy is the good guy? How how in the world does that work? I mean, come on. You know, grace and mercy and love, that's all nice, but it'll only go so far, right? I mean, this guy is like really, really, really bad. He says it in his prayer. He's not just a sinner, he's the sinner. How in the world could you call the sinner righteous? That would have been the question. And you know what? That's the question that I want to spend just our last little bit of time together trying to answer. How in the world could Jesus call the sinner 
righteous. There are three things that this tax collector understands, and these three things are really important for us to understand too. First thing the tax collector understands is that he understands the location of righteousness. He understands the location of righteousness is always in God. Always. Now, if you talk to the Pharisee and you listen to his prayer, uh, where does the Pharisee think righteousness is located? He can tell you in his prayer, I, 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 I. It's located in me. I do the right stuff. I behave in the right ways. I take the right actions. I make the right choices. Therefore, righteousness is in me. The tax collector knows that righteousness is not in him. Uh, the reformers, they had this Latin phrase uh, called extra nos, and it means outside of us. Uh, because the reformers knew that righteousness did not live in us. Righteousness was always somewhere out there. The Apostle Paul, when he was having his own existential crisis over his own righteousness, he knew that righteousness did not live inside of him. He knew that righteousness was located somewhere out there. He says in Romans 7 verse 18, I know that good, I know that righteousness, Paul says, does not dwell in me. If I want righteousness, I have to look somewhere else. And so Paul did. And so the tax collector did. Now, this leads me to the second thing the tax collector understood that's really important for us to understand, which is this. The tax collector also understood uh, the seriousness of his situation. The tax collector understood the seriousness of his situation. That's why he calls himself not just a sinner, he calls himself the sinner. He has no delusion that he is righteous. This whole story is set up with Jesus talking to people who are confident in their own righteousness. This tax collector is not confident in his own righteousness. He knows that he's in dire straits. Do you know that about you? If you were to ask yourself, just, just real honestly, how serious is my situation? What would your answer be? Uh, let me give you a little way to, to, to gauge that, okay? Okay? just so you can figure out how serious your situation is. You can gauge it in a lot of different ways. Uh, this is one of my favorite ways to try to gauge our own sinfulness. Let me just ask you one question, okay? What secrets do you have? Do you have something that maybe your spouse doesn't know and you're afraid that if they did know, they'd get really mad at you or maybe even stop loving you or maybe even leave you? then your situation's serious. Do you have something at work that you're deathly afraid of your boss finding out? Because you're worried that if he does find out, he's gonna get mad at you or dock your pay or maybe even fire you? Then your situation's serious. Do you have something from your past? A regret. Something that makes you feel guilty and you try to run from it and you try to hide from it, but it keeps creeping up on you every once in a while. And you know that you've never made it quite right. Then your situation's serious. Here's what I've discovered. Secrets are often a mask for sin. And sinfulness is the opposite of righteousness. 
This tax collector has a few things, but he doesn't have any secrets. Because <laughs> he understands the seriousness of his situation. Do you? Now, this actually leads me to the third thing the tax collector understands that is really important for us to understand. This tax collector understands the seriousness of a situation, and we got to come to a point where we say, man, I'm messed up. I'm not only a sinner, I'm like the sinner. But he also understands the solution. Not just the seriousness, but the solution to his situation. And the solution can be summed up in one word, mercy. That's what he asked God for. God, have mercy on me. I'm the sinner. God, I know I deserve judgment, wrath, condemnation, damnation. Please don't give that to me. Instead, give me mercy. Now, Jesus says that when the tax collector asks for God's mercy, you know what God says? You know how God answers that prayer? God answers that prayer with a yes. And because, because the tax collector gets mercy, you know what he also gets? He also gets righteousness. I tell you, Jesus says, this man, this tax collector, not the other man, not the man who thought he was righteous, he was the one who went home righteous before God. Here's kind of the idea. There is a way that we can be righteous but it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with Jesus. Another way to think about it is like this. There are only two paths of righteousness, and you're going to be on one or the other, okay? The first path of righteousness goes something like this. I can achieve righteousness. I can just do the right things and think the right thoughts and say the right things and look down on other people and be pious enough and be noble enough and be holy enough, be good enough to somehow be righteous. You can be on the path of achieving righteousness. That's one path, but here's what Jesus will say. That path is a dead end. It'll never get you there. And so the other path, the way that Jesus shows us and the way that Jesus actually opens for us is not the path of achieving righteousness, but the path of receiving righteousness. In other words, there is a righteousness that is out there somewhere. There's a righteousness that is extra nos. It is outside of us. And when we ask for it, when we go to God and say, have mercy on me, God always says yes. And when he says yes, we are made righteous. Because when God says yes, here's what happens. God treats Jesus as our sins deserve. That's what the cross is all about. It's all about what our sins deserve. What do our sins deserve? Our sins deserve whippings and beatings and death and condemnation and damnation. Jesus gets all of that on the cross so that he can treat us as his son deserves. Because here's, here's the greatest thing you can ever know about Jesus. Jesus was truly righteous. And so if God treats us like Jesus, God treats us as righteous. Paul puts it like this, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's Jesus. So that in him, in Jesus, we can become the righteousness of God. Martin Luther puts it like this. There's this mystery which is rich in divine grace to sinners. And the mystery is this. Wherein by a wonderful exchange 
Our sins are no longer ours, but Christ's. Our sins go to Jesus. And the righteousness of Christ gets transferred from Christ to us. Jesus, Luther says, empties himself of his righteousness so that he can clothe us with it and fill us with it. He has taken our evils upon himself so that we can be delivered from sin. It's kind of like this. Uh, when I was in grade school, I had this teacher who loved Shel Silverstein. Now, Shel Silverstein is a child's poet, and uh, Shel Silverstein writes all these great poems, and there's this, there's this one poem that I remember. It's about a dad who gives his boy a dollar, and he asks his boy to invest the dollar, to use the dollar, to spend the dollar wisely. And so here's what the boy does. Uh, here's how the poem goes. My dad gave me one dollar bill because I'm his smartest son, and I swapped it for two shiny coins quarters, because two is more than one. <laughs> and then I took the quarters, and I traded them to Lou for three dimes. I guess he didn't know that three is more than two. Just then along came old blind Bates, and just because he can't see, he gave me four nickels for my three dimes, and everyone knows that four is more than three. And then I took the nickels to Hiram Coombs down at the seed and feed store, and the fool gave me five pennies for them. And you know that five is more than four. And then I went, and I showed my dad. And he got red in the cheeks. He closed his eyes, and he shook his head. I guess he was just too proud of me to speak. You know, uh, Jesus gets the pennies so that we can have the dollar. Jesus gets our foolishness so that we can have his wisdom. Jesus gets our sinfulness so that we can have his righteousness. Because Jesus is where righteousness ultimately resides. And that means that when Jesus resides in you, real righteousness resides in you. And real righteousness is the only righteousness you really want. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you. On this day when we remember a great struggle in the church that had to do with how, how is a person made, made righteous? How do they really get in good with God? Do you do it by achieving certain things? Uh, there was an answer that comes from your scriptures, that comes from your word, that comes from your son. You never get it by achieving it. You only get it by receiving it. And so, Father, by faith, may we receive your righteousness that comes because of your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Walk with light.